So let's move on to how to cardioverge with the Lightpack 15. So we're not necessarily going to go through the whole what is cardioversion and all that, but just clearly how to use the Lightpack as your device to cardiovert. We are going to want to shock patients who are in a unstable tachycardia, whether that's a um, SVT or a VT or whatever rhythm, um, AF, as long as they are unstable, meaning that they are showing signs of shock. Um, if they are, have a decreased level of consciousness, chest pain, hypertension, and poor perfusion, these are indicators of shock. And we are wanting to make sure that this fast rhythm is causing them to be sick, not the fact that they are sick and now that's causing a fast rhythm. So how do we then do this? So first of all, you want to just make sure that you are selecting the right joules, depending on where you are and what your um, guidelines are recommending. You can start at 100 joules and make sure that you click sync. So you may ask, well, what does sync do? Why do we need to hit sync? So we don't want to shock people or defib people on the wrong part of the ECG. So if we defib people, let's say, on the T wave, we can have something called an R on T phenomena, which means that if we manage to defib someone on the R wave, then we can put them into VF. And we don't want to do that. We want to make sure that we shock them at the right point on the ECG to make sure that it is safe and effective. So here you see I have a patient in a, um, in a VT, what looks more of like a polymorphic VT. What it's doing now is it's trying to find the R wave so that we just shock in a safe spot. So the reason why that's important is that we aren't deciding when to shock, the machine is deciding when to shock, and therefore we have to hold the shock button down and allow it to choose. So we say the patient is clear, we can now shock. The other thing to consider is maybe sedation or analgesia, you know, some morphine, some fentanyl, whatever the case is, is going to work for these patients. However, they might be hypotensive, you might not have the time, you might not have the blood pressure to give them anything for pain. I did speak to someone who was cardioverted. I asked them how sore, you know, how sore was it? They didn't have time to give him something for it. And he said it was really sore, like a good eight out of 10. But he said that by the time he realized he was in pain, the pain was gone. And then he just had this like dull ache on his chest. It wasn't like there was a consistent pain that lasted a long time, but he was very grateful that we could help him. So now that we've selected the jewels, we're on sync. So the sync must be on. You can hit charge and shock. And I will charge and I'm gonna hit the button a couple of times. It probably won't discharge. It might though. And then I'm going to hold the button down and then you'll see how it releases the charge. See how it's not, not actually shocking? If I hold, it shocks. Some people will sink, they will charge and they're going to try and shock and it's not shocking. Hold the button down. Sometimes it can actually take two, three seconds and then it takes by itself. Things to be aware of is that one, we can obviously give them something for pain. Before that, however, if they don't have the blood pressure to take anything, to be really careful in terms of ketamine for a VT or an SVT. And some people are concerned that it may cause, you know, an increase in heart rate because ketamine releases um, catecholamines. If they are hypertensive and they are in a VT or uh, in like AF or whatever the case is, um, just going straight for the shock is going to be the quickest way to fix the problem rather than waiting for these medications that all take time to work. So that would be your cardioversion. Always remember sync and what's also important is that after it shocked, sync turned off. We put on sync, we set the jewels, and we then charged and shocked. So now that didn't work, so now we can up to 150, and then we can go to 200. So we select 150. Oh, see, I forgot to put sync on. So if I hit sync, it stays charged. We now know that it's synced, and then we can say shock. As, as you can see, after the shock, the sync turns off. So between each cardio version, we need to put the sync back on. Let's go to pacing. Pacing is kind of the same as cardio version, but just the opposite. So what we're doing here is cardioversion is to slow a heart rate that's too fast. Pacing is to make a heart beat faster than it is because it's because it's beating too slow. That means that you see we have a bradycardia. We're wanting to assess that the patient is unstable or has signs of shock, so hypertension, decreased level of consciousness, chest pain, signs of poor perfusion, and those are our indicators of an unstable patient. Remember, make sure that we are treating a rhythm that is causing the patient to be sick, not a sick patient who has a slow rhythm. So we need to just be more aware, or if the patient is hypoxic, which could cause a bradycardia, we don't want to just run in and pace someone who is hypoxic. Uh, we want to try and reverse these causes. So not a sick person that now has a bradycardia, we want to fix the person who has a bradycardia and now they're sick because of that bradycardia. And something I did forget to say is that there's actually a little button below the green box 
This is to change the contrast of the monitor. So as you can see, if you're in like broad daylight and you're trying to see the monitor and you can't see the monitor, this button is going to help you. So something that's really important to note and to make very clear is that you cannot pace unless you have the leads and the pads attached. So I'm just going to quickly attach these to my rhythm generator. So I have set it to a, a third degree heart block and as you see, we have a bradycardia. So in this little green square, we have the pacing module. Not all machines have a pacing module. It depends on like how much you've spent on the machine. They have different abilities. So if we hit the pacing button, it will say, it'll come up with rate. So it says 60 pulse per minute. So we can increase that if we want. Somewhere between 60 and 90 is absolutely fine. And then current, that's zero milliamps. I'm just gonna select zero. As you can see here at the bottom, it says demand. It says 70 pulse per minute and then your milliamps. So demand, what that means is that if we set the rate to 70 and the patient's intrinsic heart rate goes above 70, the machine will turn off. If you want to change it, you go to options, you go to pacing, you can say it's demand to non-demand. And what that means is then whatever the patient's heart rate does, the machine will continue to pace at 70 no matter what. If you are in a moving vehicle, or if you're in a fixed wing or a rotor wing, having it on non-demand is just safer because any of the artifacts or movement on the ECG is not going to impact the machine's ability to pace. So just be aware of that. And I will come, that, and I will come back to the non-demand demand later in terms of changing a one machine of pacing to another machine of pacing, such as when you get to hospital, how do you hand over someone who's perceiving pace? So we've set our, our pulse per minute. We are wanting to pace someone who is unstable or has signs of shock. So someone who, who's hypotensive, someone who has a decreased level of consciousness, um, someone who has chest pain or um, signs of inadequate perfusion. So we've set our, our rate to 70. We're on non-demand and our milliamps are zero. So you can control rate here. You can move it up and down or you can select it up and down and then you can control your current, so your current's on zero. So an important point to make is that monitors like the, um, the Zoll, when you increase this, it doesn't actually start to pace, or when you move this to from, from 10 to 20, it doesn't actually input that data. You have to select the 20, and then it will start doing 20, if that makes sense. So on the life pack, however, as you rotate it, it changes how much milliamps it's given. There's two chains of thoughts of, or I guess there's more than two, about how fast we should increase this. Some people say, you know, like increase and see what happens and kind of increase and see what happens. And so we can like slowly go up. But the truth is, is that this is a, a very serious um, situation. The patient is peri-arrest or they are about to go into cardiac arrest. And so we need to do this quickly. Before we do get to this point, we can also decide if we want to give anything for pain, So, because this is obviously a painful procedure. However, you're very unlikely to have the blood pressure to be able to give anything like morphine or fentanyl. Ketamine is an option, because that will um, cause a release of catecholamines that can increase the heart rate, that can increase the blood pressure. So there's nothing wrong with that, but we don't want to delay. Rather get the blood pressure up and then deal with the pain, um, rather than waiting for your drugs to start working. So if we increase the current, some people say go up slowly. Some people say each time we see a pacing spike, you can increase because that's kind of the right rate. Or what you can do is, and I've heard someone say, is just, like, just jump to 50 because it's probably not going to capture. And once you hit 50, then you can go up by 10 and go up by 10. And there we go. So as you can see on the ECG, we have pacing spikes. So these little, these little straight lines straight up is a pacing spike. And after each pacing spike, we want a QRS. So that broad QRS is exactly what we want to see after each pacing spike. So if I decrease the current back to 50, you'll see how only after maybe some of the pacing spikes we have, but that may just be what the heart's trying to do. So only once we have a QRS after each pacing spike do we know we have electrical capture. So there's three different types of capture. I'll get there now. Let's try 60. No, nope, still not. 70. Cool, there we go. We have electrical capture. So now we want to check for mechanical capture, which means we're wanting to start feeling the patient's pulse. So do not feel the patient's carotid pulse because that is going to have muscular jerking from the pacing. So we want to feel a femoral or a radial. My advice is feel a femoral and a radial because if you can feel the femoral and the radial, then you know you actually have a pretty decent blood pressure. But if you just feel a femoral and that femoral is then correlating with what you're seeing on the monitor, then we have mechanical capture, meaning that the heart is actually doing what we can see. Because remember, this is just showing us the conduction through the heart, not necessarily the movement of the heart. 
So now that we have electrical capture, we have mechanical capture, then we want to assess for physiological capture, which means that now we want to assess vital signs. So what is the blood pressure? What is the mental state? Is the patient waking up? Is the chest pain going away? And once that starts happening, then we can then start to assess um, pain. We can start managing pain. This is a good time to give some fentanyl or something that's going to last a bit longer so that we can manage his long-term pain. This is transcutaneous pacing, um, and therefore it is not a long-term solution. This person needs a transvenous pacer put in as soon as possible. And that's how to pace. So then the last button here is the pause button. So the pause button actually just stops the machine from pacing. So if I want to see what the underlying rhythm is, I can just hit pause, and what it actually does is it starts to print, so we can see what the rhythm was, and then it starts to show you what the rhythm is, and then we can let go, and then it's gonna start to pace again. And this allows the cardiologist or whoever they want to have a look at what the underlying rhythm is. That's sometimes really helpful. The other aspect that's often not really discussed or not spoken about very often is how do we transfer this machine that's pacing to another machine? So we take the patient to the hospital, and at hospital they, um, they have a Zoll, or they might have whatever other machine they might have at hospital. How do we transfer these pads which don't actually fit onto the Zoll and make sure that the patient doesn't just go into cardiac arrest while we're doing this, because this is what's keeping the patient alive. If they're not being paced, then we can use inotropes, but that's another conversation for another day. So how do we do this? So pads are generally attached um, apex and base of the heart, like you would normally attach your pads. However, you can do A and P. So you can do anterior, posterior, so the front and the back, so the A and P. So if you have a patient who you're busy pacing, what you do is you would probably put your pads on, on the apex and base of the heart, like you normally attach pads, and you're going to start pacing and you're going to get capture. You can hand over the responsibility of pacing from this machine to another machine by turning your machine onto demand. So you might be like, why demand? So what you do now is so this machine will stop pacing if the heart takes over going at a different rate. Set my heart rate to 80, which is then above the rate of this machine, and I then slowly increase the milliamps, and I slowly increase the milliamps on the other machine. As soon as the other machine gets capture at 70 beats per minute, and this one is only running at 60 beats per minute, your machine will turn off and their machine will turn on. And you have a seamless transition from your machine to their machine, and then you can turn off your machine and disconnect. Some hospitals will actually just want to take off your machine, unplug your machine from, their, from the patient to actually see what the patient is doing. I understand that, um, but sometimes you do have patients who are really sick that just can't actually take that kind of load. So yeah, so that is pacing. Um, if you have any other questions or if I've missed something or if there's something that you do that I haven't mentioned, please let me know.